And this is really a wonderful conference. It's, it's such a great recognition to a person who had such an impact on so many people. It really is wonderful to see. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. So where's the slide changer? Oh, is this it? Okay. Um, so I, I took this first part really seriously. I'm gonna talk about the impact of genetics and everything I say has a lot of biochemistry underlying it and I'm not gonna show you any of that. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a story that started some time ago, but, but first I want to say something about Pepe. So this is a photograph from uh, John Ross lab soon after Pepe arrived uh, for his first postdoctoral experience there. And John, because he was traveling a lot, he gave me the job of trying to show Pepe around to get him to know the ropes, right? So when Pepe came to Ross lab, he had a lot of experience in biochemistry. He had done a little bit of genetics, but you wouldn't call him a geneticist. And in fact, that was the same thing with me. I had done a lot of, of basic bacterial physiology. I'd done some genetics, but I really wasn't a geneticist until I'd spent time in Ross lab. And so my goal was really um, mimicking what Roth would do and to, to build that culture. And the culture was one, as already mentioned, it was one of a lot of discussion, a lot of activity. There would always be people at the whiteboard. When you had a problem, you'd say, hey, come here, what do you think of this? And people would talk about it. It was fun, it was energetic, always thinking, and that thinking was, it was the white powder that really kept people really engaged with this process. And some of us took it to heart, and Pepe is a great example of that. I've been with Pepe and a lot of other experiences, but this was a big party that Pepe threw for a bunch of friends from around the world a few years back. And this was the analytical genetics meeting, which started off as the, an annual meeting for John Roth. And in this, there are a couple of things. So first of all, you can see Pepe peeking out over there, over the top. Uh, and the other thing is that there's this other person here who had a big influence on everything I'm gonna to talk to you about. And that's this guy in the front row, Guido Mora. He's a professor from uh, Santiago, Chile. And, and the story here with Guido Mora is, Guido and I were at a Gordon conference up somewhere in the obscure northern, northeastern part of the United States. And this Gordon conference was focused on bacterial membrane proteins, right? And, and Guido and I had posters right next to each other at this conference, pretty small conference, about 100 people. And the thing about those posters is they serve wine during the poster, right? So, you know, I was talking about my poster and he was talking about his, drinking a lot of wine. And pretty soon, you know, everything's done. It. We're closing up. And Guido says to me, so Guido was, his poster was focused on outer membrane proteins and salmonella typhi, right? And I was talking about some sophisticated genetic approaches to understand ion-driven transport in salmonella typhi right? So I was using a lot of genetics and he was running gels of outer membrane proteins. So at the end of this presentation, he tells me, you guys are so lucky in salmonella typhi because you have a lot of genetic tools and we have no genetics in salmonella typhi, right? Nothing. And of course I'd had a couple glasses of wine. I said, oh yeah, that would be really easy. We could make genetic tools for salmonella typhi, no problem. And so a week later, I get a call from Guido Mora. He was in New York city after this conference. And he said, I've been thinking about a lot about what you said. Can I come visit your lab and just talk to you about it? So he came and we talked for about half hour. As I said, I love this talking about ideas in science. And then at a certain point, he said, well, I have some salmonella typhi in my suitcase. Can we do some experiments? <laughs> <laughs> and so we started doing experiments that led to a very long time collaboration with his students coming back and forth and me going to Chile a lot. 
So very quickly on, we developed P22 transduction approach to, that works to deliver things into Typhi. We showed delivery of trans plasmids and transposons. We understood homeologous recombination between the two organisms, developed uh, approaches for delivery of small segments of the chromosome and uh, HFRs that we could use. So we've done this. My lab, I'd probably spent five years developing genetic tools that they could use. And at some point I said, hey, you know, I probably ought to do something that uses these tools we've developed, right? Because we'd been doing everything in Typhimurium. And so this tells a story about salmonella host specificity from a pure genetic perspective. Uh, and I'll tell you why we got into that in a minute. But first I wanna point out that it involves a variety of, of students and collaborators from the United States and from Chile who, who did really phenomenal work here. So Salmonella enterica, this is the big story here. Salmonella enterica has over 2,500 different strains. We say over 2,500 because at some point you just stop counting, right? Um, and they, when you look at them all, you can find a bunch of differences, but the real key thing to me is they fall into these three categories. Some are generalists, like Salmonella typhimurium, Salmonella enteritidis. They will infect anything that will walk, fly, or crawl on the face of the earth. And, and some things that don't, such as plants, okay? Host adapted Salmonella, Salmonella Dublin, Salmonella colorsuis, some others, they'll, they'll infect a lot of different organisms, but they have a specific affinity for certain kinds of organisms, right? So Salmonella Dublin causes serious disease in cattle, but it will also infect mice, it'll affect humans. Then there are these host specific organisms like Salmonella typhi. Salmonella typhi infects humans, that's it. You, you can read studies saying it will infect chimpanzees, but it does not infect chimpanzees nearly as well as it affects humans. And when you think about how close humans and chimpanzees are, that really says a lot, right? So I said, look, if we're gonna look at some question, this is the big question, if you wanna understand things in Salmonella typhi. What, what if, that I thought, what's the, what's the reason? How did they evolve to have this difference? What's happening in Salmonella typhi that's making it host specific, right? And so, um, so this host specificity is a big deal. If you look at typhimurium and you provide them interperitoneally in valve C mice, basically one organism will kill the mouse. And if you do the same thing with typhi, it takes about 10 million and then the mice die from LPS shock, right? They don't die from salmonella. Right? So, so what's going on there? What's the genetics? And so if you say, all right, there's three kinds of things that could be happening. It could be some loss of function mutation. It could be some altered function mutation, or it could be some gain of function mutation, including an island or something along those lines, right? The three kinds of mutations you typically see. So, so in the process of thinking about this, we got clues from comparative genomics about the differences between these organisms, right? Now, there were, we started off doing draft genome sequencing. We thought that would be enough. We were wrong, wrong, wrong. And a number of other groups did a much better job with the genomics. But the take home point is that most of the salmonella share the major virulence loci. Not all, but many of the major loci. There's about 97% identity in common genes, in the shared genes. About 10% of each genome is unique. Um, and the real striking thing is that in the host specific serovars, they have a lot more pseudogenes than in the generals. This actually is a commonality of bacteria in general. And the host specific serovars accumulate chromosome rearrangements at levels that you don't see in the generalists, right? So the big question is, how can you figure out of all of those differences, how do you figure out which ones are important, right? So you 
You get the sequence using the sequinator. You can look at proteins using protein analysis machines. What you really need here is a functionator, right? And the functionator, I would argue, is always genetics. Okay. So, so here are the genetic approaches you could take. You could say, okay, let's do complementation, right? So maybe the problem with Typhi is it's missing a Murium gene. Right? So if we simply do complementation, we can provide that Murium gene to Typhi. So we built a, a whole series of cosmids, did a real thorough analysis. This did not work for us. I have to say, after we had started doing this, uh, Stan Falco, the father of molecular pathogenesis, Stan Falco said, oh, I tried that before too, and it didn't work for me either, right? <laughs> and then Roy Curtis III says, oh, I tried that, and it didn't work for me. So we were in good company there. Um, so then we said, well, maybe, maybe there is um, a, an issue that we need to, that, that Typhi has an A variance mouse gene, so we need to disrupt that. We mutagenized the wazoo out of the genomes. We could never find such a gene. So then we thought, okay, what about recombination? In recombination, you can, you can both exchange genes, bring in genes, and uh, remove genes simultaneously in one fell swoop, right? So we set up a system to do this, and that system basically told us that there were multiple unlinked loci. The system was basically a system where we built HFR strains that were located at ribosomal RNA genes that are present around the chromosome of Typhi and Typhimurium. Okay, so we could exchange very large regions of the chromosome. And once we identified something, we could go in and map it using P22 transduction to figure out narrowly where it boom. How about that? It's in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> this is from a talk I gave in Chile. Um, so when we started doing this, this mapping, right, the, the genetic mapping just told us the relative vicinity. But by that time, the genome of T, TY2 had been sequenced. And when we started looking at where these regions were, a lot of them lined up very strongly with regions where there were pseudogenes present in the genome map, right? So this doesn't tell us that it's the pseudogene that's important, but it led us to think, oh, maybe these pseudogenes are playing a key role in here. So we wanted to ask, do the pseudogenes limit host range, right? So we set up a system, a very simple system, where we can disrupt the Salmonella typhimerium gene by inserting at a precise type chloramphenicol resistance and tetracycline resistance for that particular gene we want to mutate. And then we can replace that gene with the Salmonella typhi pseudogene, the very specific allele for only that tiny region of the chromosome. We can do this selection because it allows us to select chloramphenicol resistance here and to select tetracycline sensitivity here. So it's the genetic benefit of having a selection and counter selection simultaneously. Okay. Once we go in and we've made these strains where we've altered the pseudogenes, now we can say, let's just try the simple thing. And this is what Carmen described earlier about doing the competition analysis in mice. So we take the mutant and the wild type and inject we did everything interperitoneally in mice. We cover what's coming out from the liver and spleen after infection, and basically figure out if there's an impact that decreases um, the ability of Salmonella typhimurium in this case to survive in mice. So when we did this, uh, we tested a bunch of genes. Here's just a few examples. So we made a, a SOPD mutant, and the SOPD knockout mutant that has transposons in it has a weak competition effect, very small competition effect, right? 
if we put in the pseudogene, it has a competition effect that is essentially the same as if we have a knockout mutant. So that's immediately really important because it tells us that the pseudogene is probably acting like a true knockout mutation. We can do the same thing with SSCJ. We get a small effect too. When we put these together, we have an additive effect. And we see this with a lot of the pseudogenes that we've looked at. So we did studies interperitoneally with some other pseudogenes that interperitoneally had absolutely no effect. Andreas Baumler looked at those mutations in an oral model of infection, and he showed that in the oral model of infection, those particular pseudogenes played a very important role in survival in the gut. Okay. So, uh, and the reason for that is because this whole system, uh, B12 dependent electro, uh, electron transport system is really important for the bacteria within the gut. Um, Salmonella typhi causes systemic infection, right? It lives mostly inside of a host in some long-term sites associated with gallbladder. And so this is less of an issue for typhimurium than it is for typhi. So here's the, here's the results. Salmonella typhi pseudogenes act like null mutations. They act like genuine knockouts. They limit systemic growth and intestinal growth in mice, in typhimurium, right? Accumulation of these pseudogenes will restrict the host niche, right? If you take these typhi pseudogenes, one reason they can't infect mice is because of these particular alleles, right? And multiple events give you attenuating mutations at many sites on the chromosome. Now, these multiple events, I might add, once you've knocked out the first gene in vitamin B12 biosynthesis, all of the other genes in that very big pathway become neutral for mutations. So accumulating a second mutation is no worse than the first mutation. Okay, so, so here's the problem. So this suggested the pseudogenes were important, right? But it doesn't give us a way of looking in real time. All of this is archaeology. And if you want to see evolution, it's so nice to be able to see things while they are happening, right? So one clue to this came because uh, we, we noticed that genome rearrangements happen more readily in Salmonella typhi than in typhimurium. So we could ask the question, well, is there a difference in intramolecular recombination in generalists versus host specific bacteria. Right? So we could look at a variety of types of different changes. And one of the key things that led us to look at this was some beautiful work by Lou and Sanderson, where they used the homing endonuclease ICEU1, which cuts specifically within the ribosomal genes of bacteria and did a lot of PFE. Uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis analysis of different salmonella strains. So that analysis suggested that the RRN regions of the genomes are changing a lot in salmonella typhi. So here's, here's the results of theirs. When you look at the ribosomal RNA genes in salmonella typhimurium, there's seven of them. And in salmonella typhimurium, they are essentially always in this same arrangement. You could take typhimurium from an infection anywhere in the world. Sometimes you can see rearrangements, but this is the standard arrangement that you see. It's the same arrangement as you see in E. coli as well. So this is, if you would, the, the historical orientation. Now, when you do the same thing and you look at Salmonella typhi, you can see here, look, there's been an inversion between the ribosomal RNAs up at the top. So from DEF, we now have um, EFD. And 
there's change up here. We have B, A, and G. So there's been a flip of that part of the chromosome, specifically by recombination between the ribosomal RNA genes. Now, this is only one of the arrangements. So Lou and Sanderson did this for Salmonella typhi from around the world. And they found that if you take Salmonella typhi from what is believed to be the origin of an outbreak, and the outbreak itself, this seems to happen during the outbreak in real time. So we wanted to say, why are the genomes of these host-specific salmonella more plastic? Is it a physical reason? Is it because there's replica balance issues tied to the chromosome of salmonella typhi? Is it a biochemical region? Is there a difference between the recombination machinery? Or is it an ecological reason that is, does it have something to do with that lifestyle of being host-specific? The strong prediction here is, if it's a physical or biochemical reason, we should be able to see this both in vivo and in vitro. Because right? it's a basic part, a fundamental part of those bacteria. But if it has to do with the host-specific lifestyle, we won't see it in petri dishes, but we will see it during the infection of the host. Right? This is a real strong prediction it makes for us. Um, we have easier ways of doing the analysis of the chromosome arrangement. We developed a quick PCR strain, a PCR approach for doing this. And that PCR approach basically just looked for differences associated with the products of, of different primers. So you could see rearrangements in the chromosome. But look, here's a problem. Because the ribosomal RNA genes have such similarity, once you start uh, doing the polymerase chain reaction, then you're gonna get hybridization with other ribosomal regions, right? So whenever you do this, you see ghost bands in the background, right? And because you see those ghost bands, you cannot see very, very rare events. You can only see those events that are most common. Okay? So because of that, we needed to develop a genetic selection for this. A famous quote is that one genetic selection is worth a thousand screens. And this is the idea. So these little arrows are ribosomal RNA genes. At the end of one, we stuck chloramphenicol resistance, and the other, we stuck canamycin resistance. These two antibiotic resistant markers are far away from each other on the chromosome normally. But if a recombination event occurs between these ribosomal regions, now they're gonna be sitting right next door to each other at the ends of a single ribosomal RNA offering. So we have a very simple way of telling if that's happened. We grow phage on this, and the phage can only package a small region of the chromosome. So those phage, if no recombination happens, can allow transfer of chloramphenicol resistance or canamycin resistance, but never both. And if recombination happens, we'll get transfer of both markers simultaneously, okay? By looking at the strains um, of Typhi and Typhimurium, we can see that basically the frequency of these inversions in vitro is really the same in both sets of organisms, right? And because it's the same in both sets of organisms, it indicates to us that this is not due to some inherent chromosomal or physiological reason, it's likely due to changes in ecology, okay? There are a whole series of differences in ecology. If you were a free living organism that can infect a lot of different hosts versus if you have only a single host 
We think that there are a lot of humans on Earth, but it's a very tiny number compared to the number of mice and other organisms. So look, here's the problem. How do you do this in the host when the host is humans, right? So we were very, we were very lucky and there were a series of women from Eastern Europe who were much less lucky. So it ends up that in the former Soviet Union, Union in East Germany, there was through periods of time, a real lack of antibiotics to treat serious infections. And so there were a number of women, and this is primarily women that these, this happened to, that became carriers of salmonella typhi. And so over a series of years, they sampled, made isolates of the salmonella from those different women carriers. And they stored those samples because they weren't sure what the heck to do with them. So we uh, learned about this from our colleague at the Robert Koch Institute where they'd stored all the samples. And all of these had been phage typed, they'd been analyzed thoroughly. And we wanted to ask about chromosomal organization, right? This is one of those carriers. So in 1976, the first sample taken never treated with antibiotic or any other treatment for disease. The order on the chromosome, I've turned this into numbers. So the order of those RNA, ribosomal RNA genes, there's two types in there in that first sample. So two different types, not one. In 1981, analysis, a thorough analysis of the sample taken from that woman, there was only one type. In 1983, there was still that one type in 1986. Now we had three different types and on through 1991. This story is similar story in all of the 20 women that we had samples from. And this tells us that in, during that infection process, rearrangements are happening in these chromosomes. Now, importantly, right, we did not see rearrangements happening in vitro when we looked at these analyses. So it was happening in people, it was not happening in vitro. So, and I might add one other thing there, we found also because of our collaborations with, um, with Wolf, that there are typhimerium strains that have become adapted to German pigeons that lived on the wall between West and East Germany. And those strains became niche restricted. Um, they retained mouse virulence, but they had a strong preference for infecting pigeons. And they showed an intermediate level of chromosome rearrangements relative to their typhimerium peers. Right? So here's the, here's the take home point from all of this. A new niche particular host gives you relaxed genetic selection. Relaxed genetic selection, when spontaneous mutations and rearrangements happen, they can be trapped. Genetic uh, bottlenecks produce Mueller's ratchet, which allows you to accumulate more and more mutational load. Those accumulated mutations ultimately result in niche restriction. And this is a story that really relates to uh, some elegant work on host uh, on very specific pathogens, where if you look at generalist on up to obligate intracellular bacteria, there is an increase in rearrangements and uh, recombination ultimately drops off when you get to be an obligate intracellular organism. So it looks like from this level, this is a general prediction that works for all these organisms. Now, what I haven't told you is the biochemistry of dissecting, which are the most important loci here. I think you're gonna hear some more about that later on. And also I think that, that some of the work from Jay Hinton's group, where they're looking at uh, Salmonella typhimurium strains that are, that are causing um, 
systemic infections in humans in Africa, I think that like the pigeons, that provides an intermediate example of this evolutionary change. Okay, this is the real take home point. And this comes from a book that Pepe and Kelly Hughes and I wrote many years ago called The Lure of Bacterial Genetics. The basic idea is that despite incredible insights from amazing technologies, genetics is still to this day, the best functionator. And as in all the stories we've heard about Pepe, it's also incredibly stimulating and fun field to work in. Thank you.